Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our Cato Book Forum. My name is David Bowes. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Institute. Um, I imagine we're going to have more people coming in as we go. So those of you who are on the aisles, be alert to people wanting to get a seat. And of course, we always encourage people who are arriving late to sit up front, but nobody ever wants to do that. So uh, watch the aisle seats. Um, we are going to be discussing today this new book from Cambridge University Press, Are Liberty and Equality Compatible? And this is, of course, a very old question in political philosophy. Can the ideals of political liberty and equality be reconciled? Are they indeed compatible? Of course, we have to clarify what we mean by equality. Equality in the eyes of God, equality under the law, equality of opportunity, equality of outcomes, equality of assets. What do we mean by equality? In this book, two distinguished political philosophers will take up this debate, uh, or actually in the book, they already have taken up the debate. Today, they will take it up here. Jan Narvison argues that a political ideal of negative liberty is incompatible with any substantive ideal of equality, while James Sturba argues that Narvison's own ideal of negative liberty is compatible and, in fact, leads to the requirements of a substantive ideal of equality. Obviously, they can't both be right. James P. Sturba is professor of philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. His previous books include Justice for Here and Now, Affirmative Action for the Future, and Does Feminism Discriminate Against Men, a topic he also uh, debated here at Cato when that book came out. Jan Narvison is Distinguished Professor Emeritus at the University of Waterloo. He is perhaps best known for his book, The Libertarian Idea. His other books include Moral Matters, Respecting Persons in Theory and Practice, and You and the State. I would note that in addition to this book, several of Professor Narvison's books are available outside, and this is probably the best price that you will get on this new book from Cambridge or any of the other books that are available out there. We'll have opening statements and then formal rebuttals from each author, and then we'll open the floor to questions. And after that, of course, books will be available for signing and sandwiches for eating. Please welcome Professor James Sturba. Many thanks to David Boaz and the Cato Institute for inviting Jan and myself to this book forum. Bringing a book that discusses libertarianism to the Cato Institute may seem like bringing the proverbial coals to Newcastle. But these are hard economic times, especially for the poor in this country. So bringing a debate book that on one side argues that libertarianism requires a strong right to welfare and more might surprisingly turn out to be a valuable contribution to the thinking and work that goes on in this premier institution. In our book, Are Liberty and Equality Compatible? Jan Narvison argues that a political ideal of negative liberty is incompatible with any substantive ideal of equality, while I argue that Jan's own ideal of negative liberty is compatible with and, in fact, leads to the requirements of a substantive ideal of equality. That is the way I like to see the debate between Jan and myself. And it is the way that is written up in the general introduction and the blurbs for our book. That is not, however, the way that Jan likes to see our debate. Jan prefers to see us both approaching our topic as social contract theorists, thereby committed to finding principles of political philosophy that everyone would reasonably agree to uphold. Approaching our topic this way, Jan thinks that everyone would reasonably agree to uphold a principle of equal negative liberty a principle that says we should not interfere with other people. Jan further thinks that after endorsing this principle, it is unlikely that everyone would go beyond it to endorse some form of egalitarianism that requires the provision of more or less extensive bundles of other social goods to each and every person. As I see it, however, even the initial choice Jan describes is more complicated than he makes it out to be. This is because we are not faced with just one equal liberty principle to accept or reject. Instead, we are faced with many such principles, the most defensible of which, I claim, also requires substantive, substantive equality. 
It is in this way that the libertarian ideal of liberty can itself be shown to require substantive equality. Let me briefly explain how this argument from liberty to equality goes. Consider a conflict situation between the rich and the poor. In this conflict situation, the rich, of course, have more than enough resources to satisfy their basic needs. In contrast, imagine the poor lack the resources to meet their most basic needs, even though they tried all the means available to them that libertarians regard as legitimate for acquiring such resources. Under circumstances like these, libertarians maintain that the rich should have the liberty to use their resources to satisfy their luxury needs if they so wish. Libertarians recognize that this liberty might well be enjoyed with the consequence that the satisfaction of the basic needs of the poor will not be met. They just think that liberty always has priority over other political ideals, and since they tend to assume that the liberty of the poor is not at stake in such conflict situations, it is easy for them to conclude that the rich should not be required to sacrifice their liberty so that the basic needs of the poor may be met. Of course, libertarians allow that it be nice for the rich to share their surplus resources with the poor. Nevertheless, according to libertarians, such acts of charity are not required because the liberty of the poor is not usually thought to be at stake in such conflict situations. In fact, however, the liberty of the poor is at stake in such conflict situations. What is at stake is the liberty of the poor not to be interfered with in taking from the surplus possessions of the rich what is necessary to satisfy their basic needs. Needless to say, libertarians want to deny that the poor have this liberty. But how can they justify such a denial? As this liberty of the poor has been specified, it is not a positive liberty to receive something, but a negative liberty of non-interference. Clearly what libertarians must do is recognize the existence of such a liberty and then claim that it unjustifiably conflicts with liberties of the rich and is thereby rendered illegitimate. So when the conflict between the rich and the poor is viewed as a conflict of liberties, we can either say that the rich should have the liberty not to be interfered with in using their surplus resources for luxury purposes, or we can say that the poor should have the liberty not to be interfered with in taking from the rich what they require to meet their basic needs. If we choose one liberty, we must reject the other. What needs to be determined, therefore, is which liberty is morally enforceable, the liberty of the rich or the liberty of the poor. This means that there are at least two candidates for the equal negative liberty principle that Jan thinks that everyone would reasonably agree to uphold. One such principle would provide equal, that is the same liberties to each and every person, but that principle would include the liberty when you're rich not to be interfered with by the poor and using your surplus for luxury purposes. The other principle would provide equal, that is the same liberties to each and every person, but that principle would include the opposing liberty when you are poor not to be interfered with by the rich when taking from their surplus what you require to meet your basic needs. In essence, the second equal liberty principle, by favoring the liberty of the poor over the liberty of the rich, provides the basis for a right to welfare, whereas the first equal liberty principle, by favoring the liberty of the rich over the liberty of the poor, rejects any such right to welfare. So while Jan sees everyone as initially facing a choice of whether or not to agree to uphold an equal liberty principle, I have shown that the, an equal liberty principle itself has different instantiations. And what is most important for our purposes is that one such instantiation of the principle rejects a right to welfare, while another instantiation requires a right to welfare. Yet all that I've done so far is show that Jan at least needs to complicate his argument for the incompatibility of liberty and equality. I've not yet shown that his argument is mistaken. While Jan thought he could show that everyone would first face the choice of whether to agree to uphold an equal negative liberty principle, and then face the choice of whether to go beyond such a principle in favor of some form of egalitarianism, I have shown that the choice is better that is more neutrally represented as a choice over which equal liberty principle to uphold. You can further see that this is the case by considering what it would mean, given Jan's construal of the choice situation, for people to agree to go beyond an equal liberty principle and favor some form of egalitarianism. Such a move would be equivalent to rejecting Jan's preferred equal liberty principle in favor of an equal liberty principle that requires a right to welfare. So even an analysis of Jan's own way of construing the choice situation 
can be seen to be equivalent to the choice over which equal liberty principle everyone would reasonably agree to uphold. Our debate thus comes down to the choice over which equal liberty principle, one that requires a right to welfare or one that rejects such a right, everyone would reasonably agree to uphold. That seems to be the fairest way of putting the debate between Jan and myself. As I see it, everything depends on an answer to that question. But what is the answer? What would everyone reasonably agree to uphold? Well, you look like a group of reasonable people here. Let's see what you think is reasonable to uphold. How many of you think, by show of hands, uh, that we all should uphold an equal liberty principle that rejects a right to welfare? OK. You ain't in the APA anymore, Jim. <laughs> OK, how many of you think that we all should uphold an equal liberty principle that requires a right to welfare? Hmm. Clearly no unanimity here. And notice that this lack of unanimity is not just a problem for Jan's view, it is also one for my own view as well. Since we both wanted to ground our views on principles that everyone would reasonably agree to uphold. Yet given the disagreement that I've just elicited, either both of our projects are doomed to failure, or I haven't posed the question in exactly the right way so that we can see how it will receive the same answer from everyone. Now I'm hoping that this second alternative obtains. So let me try to explain how the question needs to be posed in order to elicit the same answer from everyone. First, Jan and I agree that one's moral views should not be brought to bear when people are trying to determine what political principles they should reasonably agree to uphold. Our shared view here is that morality itself is the outcome of this choice. Morality does not determine the principles we should choose. So if you were thinking that you have a moral right to your surplus, and accordingly you should not have to give it to the poor, alternatively, if you were thinking that the poor have a moral right to welfare, and therefore that you should, su you should support such a right, and if these were the reasons you were favoring one of these liberty principles over the other, then you weren't making the choice the way Jen and I wanted you to make it. We both recognize that different moral views would favor different choices. But we also recognize that it's difficult to show that one particular moral perspective is preferable to all others. So we both want to ground the choice of political principles here in something that is still more fundamental. Similarly, we are presupposing that your religious views are not determining your choice. We are assuming here, although we can argue for it, the morality that would emerge from this choice should constrain whatever obligations religion might impose. So if some of you were using religious views to make your choice, then too, it is no surprise that we got the lack of unanimity we did. Nevertheless, while Jen and I are in agreement that the choice facing everyone should not be made on the basis of people's prior moral and religious views, we still do not yet agree on what grounds the choice should be made. As Jan sees it, the choice should be made on the basis of mutual benefit so that it would serve everyone's self-interest. That is why he argues that a principle of equal liberty that rejects a right to welfare would be chosen. As he sees it, having a liberty principle that contains a right to welfare would require the rich to sacrifice their interests for the sake of the poor. That would not be part of a mutual benefit scheme. So Jan claims everyone would not reasonably agree to uphold an equal liberty principle that requires a right to welfare. That, in a nutshell, I think, is Jan's argument for how the choice would be made. So what's mine? Again, I'm not going to appeal to morality or religion here to support my view. What I'm going to claim is that we are in need of a good argument as to which equal liberty principle we should choose. And a good argument, by definition, will not beg the question. This means that the argument will not ignore important interests that people have in reaching its conclusion about what equal liberty principle everyone would reasonably agree to uphold. Unfortunately, that is exactly what Jan's construal of the choice situation does. It ignores the interests that poor people have in having their basic needs met because those interests conflict with the interests that rich people have in using their surplus for luxury purposes. In my view, to make the choice non-question beggingly, we must take into account the conflicting interests that people have, as well as their non-conflicting interests of mutual benefit. But how do we do that? 
Here's one way. We need to idealize a bit to do this, but I think you will get the idea and see how it is a way of non-question-beggingly taking everyone's conflicting and non-conflicting interests into account. Consider a ranking of your own self-interest from your most important interest to your least important interest. Now consider a ranking of the self-interest of others from their most important interest to their least important interest. Now some of the interests in these rankings will not be in conflict. Furthering them will serve the interests of yourself and others. These involve mutual benefit, where the liberty of yourself and the liberty of others are fully compatible. Clearly, we should all be in favor of promoting such liberties. Nevertheless, there will be other situations where your interests and liberties come into conflict with the interests or liberties of others. Let us set aside those cases where your high-ranking interests come into conflict with the high-ranking interests of others. Those cases are like lifeboat cases and any of you is going to have some difficulty resolving such cases. Far more numerous are cases where your high-ranking interests come into conflict with the low-ranking interests of others, or the high-ranking of interests of others come into conflict with your low-ranking interests. In such cases, I claim that a non-question-begging way to resolve such conflicts is to have high-ranking interests trump low-ranking interests. In this way, the high-ranking interests of the poor having their basic needs met will trump the low-ranking interests of the rich in being able to use their surplus for luxury purpose. And this, I claim, will ground a right to welfare. Thus, a non-question-begging preference for the high-ranking interests of the poor over low-ranking interests of the rich will favor the choice of an equal liberty principle that requires just such a right. In our book, Jan takes me to be a minimal egalitarian who tries to support a right to welfare limited to one's own society. However, for many years in both my published work and in my public presentations, I have argued that when a right to welfare is extended to distant peoples and future generations, it leads to substantial equality. Here, I, I see myself as simply following out the libertarian idea that the basic rights that people have do not stop at the borders. Of course, when libertarians argue for this universalistic view of rights, they usually do not recognize that the right to liberty they champion leads to a right to welfare. In any case, all that I have done in this book is explore the unintended but I think clear consequence of the libertarian view. So let me briefly show how the libertarian grounded right to welfare that I have just argued for leads to substantial equality. To meet the basic needs of the poor throughout the world, Thomas Pogge has proposed a 1% tax on aggregate global income netting $312 billion annually. Peter Singer, as an alternative, has proposed a graduated tax on the incomes of the top 10% of US families, netting $404 billion annually, with an equal sum coming from the family incomes of people living in other industrialized countries. Both Pogge and Singer are confident that their proposals will go a long way toward meeting basic human needs worldwide. In fact, Singer remarks that before coming up with his recent proposal, he never, quote, fully understood how easy it would be for the world's rich to eliminate or virtually eliminate global poverty." End of quote. Yet while Pogge and Singer's proposals would doubtless do much to secure a right to welfare for existing people, unfortunately they do not speak very well to the needs of future generations. In the U.S. currently more than one million acres of arable land are lost from cultivation each year due to urbanization, multiplying transport networks, and industrial expansion. Of course, this has slowed a bit with the economic downturn. In addition, another two million acres of farmland are lost each year due to erosion, salination, and waterlogging. The state of Iowa alone has lost one half of its fertile topsoil from farming in the last 100 years. That loss is about 30 times faster than what is sustainable. According to one estimate, only six-tenths of an acre of arable land per person will be available in the U.S. in 2050, whereas more than 1.2 acres per person are needed to provide a diverse diet. Currently, 1.6 acres of arable land are available. Similar, even more threatening estimates of the loss of arable land have been made for other regions of the world. How then are we going to preserve farmland and other food-related natural resources so that future generations are not deprived of what they require to meet their basic needs? And what about other resources as well? It's been estimated that presently a North American uses 75 times more resources than the resident of India. This means that in terms of resource consumption, the North American continent's population is the equivalent of 22.5 billion Indians. 
So unless we assume that basic resources such as arable land, iron, coal, and oil are in limited supply, this unequal consumption will have to be radically altered if the basic needs of future generations are to be met. I submit, therefore, that until we have a technological fix on hand, recognizing a universal right to welfare applicable to both existing and future people requires us to use up no more resources than are necessary for meeting our own basic needs, thus securing for ourselves a decent life, but no more. For us to use up more resources than this without a technological fix on hand, we would be guilty of depriving at least some future generations of the resources they would require to meet their own basic needs, thereby violating their libertarian-based right to welfare. Obviously, this would impose a significant sacrifice on existing generations, particularly those in the developed world, including a far greater sacrifice than Pogge and Singer maintaining is required for meeting the basic needs of existing generations. Nevertheless, these demands do follow from a libertarian-based right to welfare. In effect, recognizing a right to welfare applicable to all existing and future people leads to an equal utilization of resources over place and time. In this way, I think, everyone can be reasonably brought to agree to uphold an equal liberty principle that requires substantial equality, but only, of course, if people behave reasonably and do not reject the force of a good argument. Thank you. Jan Narbison. Um, hello, I'm, I'm really impressed to see such a sizable audience here to uh, uh, listen to a discussion on a topic quite as, in a sense, rarefied as this. Well, <clears throat> which introduces uh, uh, an important point here. The discussion between um, me and Sturba goes on at really two, two levels, roughly what I'll call the, the abstract or sort of philosophical level, and uh, on the other hand, the here and now real world. Now, one might argue, as many, including Sturba himself, have, that it's really only the latter that matters, only the real world. And one might infer from this, as Jim, to his credit, does not, that it isn't worth wasting your time at the first level. Now, I think we both happily disagree with the latter. You guide practice in the light of um, ideas, which can be worked out in an essentially abstract stage, even though you get onto that stage as a result of your immersion in and experiences of the real world. So my abstract world, and in a sense, Jim's, whether it is, is a very interesting and important que question, as we will see. But prima facie, we're both starting out in the abstract world of Hobbes's state of nature. Does everybody, has everybody, is there anybody here who hasn't read Hobbes or hasn't heard of Hobbes even? Ah, great, I'm talking to the right people. This is very easily misunderstood, though. I take Hobbes, rightly or wrongly, it doesn't matter here as a point of interpretation, to be saying that morality is not just a basic part of human nature. It needs explaining, and indeed it needs justifying, in terms of a prior and more fundamental notion of rationality. Now, that prior notion is a pretty well common property nowadays to us and economists and lots of other people. It is that a rational agent is guided by two things. Firstly, his interests, as he sees them. If you like, you could call those his values. That's OK, too, as long as you don't uh, presuppose anything that we're trying to get out of this in the way of morality. And secondly, his information base regarding on what's going on around him, and in particular, how that affects his choice of actions. He chooses then, on the basis of this information, the actions that he hopes or expects will do the best by the schedule of interests or values that he actually has. Now, if morality, which is a set of uh, requirements notionally imposed on everybody, and it's a set of requirements, meaning it tells us to do things that we might not like to do at the time. It, it, it overrides our initial interests. So if something like that is going to be relevant, if it's going to have any clout, then it has to be, some, it has to be such because having such a thing will somehow serve our interests. Not our moral interests, just our interests. Thus, we can select and improve those peculiar sets of instructions called moralities uh, for all on the basis of how they impact on our interests. Now, for most people, most interests include both 
what Sturba would call egoistic and what he would call altruistic ones. And I mean, I would too. I'm just in the, this is common terminology here, in varying proportions. Very varying proportions. Some people have virtually none of the altruistic ones, and some have apparently astonishing little of the uh, self-interested ones. It would be, to use an expression very important to both of us, question begging to assume that people didn't vary in these respects. And it would be misguided to argue that those who lack one or another sort of them are somehow bad guys who don't count. And the reason for this is we're dealing with everybody. Here's the world. It's all kinds of people out there. We bump into them. They bump into us. The question is, what are we going to do? You cannot just rule some people out because there they are. What I have claimed is that taking into account this whole range of variation in what people are like, we can hope to find some uniform moral rule or rules among possible rules that require us sometimes to do things other than we like to do at the time. All right? We cannot do this by just consulting our independent interests, such as, for example, a desire that the world be of the following kind. Well, la ti da. It's, everybody has desires like that. Hey, we'd like that the world be like this. Who cares? The answer is, if other people don't share your view, then it's completely useless for this purpose because you're trying to deal with those people. And that's why we have to talk what amounts to social contract talk. So we seek rules which everybody can reasonably accept, provided that everyone else does too. Now, it's the proviso that matters. Remember, we're not just talking about ideals in the sense of views of what we think would be really nice if everybody was like. We're talking about sets of rules which there's at least decent reason to think that everybody can see reason to accept, Re uh, rules calling for restrictions on behavior. Since they restrict your actions as well as mine, it is possible that if you restrict yours in those ways, that benefits me enough to make it worthwhile for me to restrict mine in relation to you. That's the general logic of the social contract, my position. Now, my thesis is that this one general rule of this kind that can meet the requirement of universal rational acceptance would be the libertarian rule, understood as forbidding what we would call uh, aggressions in some circles, um, uh, understood as forbidding interventions by one person that worsened the situation or threatened to worsen the situation of the other one. So my saying um, here, you do the following, and if you don't, I'll kick you, is a violation of the liberty principle. Um, to put it the other way around then, the fundamental rule that I think passes acceptance, and by the way, so did Hobbes and Kant and a bunch of other uh, interesting people, um, gives everybody a general right of liberty, which holds good for him unless and until he violates the same right on the part of somebody else. I take it that this rule implies all the Lockean things, moral security against invasion of one's persons, one's health and one's level of well-being, one's freedom of external action, so long as it is consistent with the like freedom of all, and therefore, in my view, therefore is important, uh, one's property. They don't include, on the other hand, requirements that we help others to any particular degree, and that's where my discussion with Sturba kicks in, for he claims it does. So why do I claim it doesn't? Basically, it's because relative to the baseline of having no rules at all, anyone can be sure to do better by not being attacked, since attacking, by definition, worsens me in respects that matter to me. Of course, your helping me, too, would be nice. But am I all ready to help anybody else out there? Maybe, but maybe not. It might be, not be worth it to me to offer help to you. I don't necessarily gain from helping others because it might not be reciprocated. Might not, either because I might not need your help of that kind or because you may not even be capable of rendering it anyway. And on the other hand, I might be quite capable of rendering help to you and so it's asymmetric. It doesn't look like it would be a paying proposition for me to commit myself to helping everybody who needs help just because he needs it. Um, it does have to be borne in mind, I mean, if we can't overemphasize that there's loose talk about needs here, especially basic needs in the case of Jim. And 
the point to be made here is, whatever your needs are, they don't necessarily matter to me. But we're looking for rules for both of us, not just you in relation to me. All right, so the world isn't your oyster. It's all of our oysters. And therefore, you simply can't count on everybody being all ready to help you out just because you need help. On the other hand, we all need not to be attacked. We can all depend on having an interest in the freedom to do the things that we want to do. And so there we have common ground. There we have a common good we can get to. Uh, we don't have it in the case of any sort of mutual uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, welfare. Now, um, the reason for considering self-interest to be really more fundamental than altruism is easy to see. Consider someone for whom it's only the interests of certain or even all other people that really matter very much. Okay, now about those other people, um, the objects of their altruistic desires, do they count or not? And if they do, why do they? Ultimately, a theorist promoting altruistic action is going to have to say that, yes, they do count, and they do so by taking into account the effects on them themselves that this putatively altruistic person's approved actions would have on them if put into effect. In other words, an altruistic action is altruistic because it has effects on the other person, which from that person's self-interested point of view are good things. So there's a complete asymmetry here. Self-interest is fundamental. Altruism is derivative. It isn't that altruism doesn't happen. It isn't that most of us aren't at least somewhat altruistic. We are. It's that altruistic cannot be absolutely fundamental. And therefore, for theoretical purposes, we might as well talk about everything from the point of view of uh, self-interest. Now, <clears throat> Struba claims that I am biasing things by looking for rules that would win the unanimous consent of all when some of them are highly non-altruistic. Of course, I never claim that nobody is altruistic. That would be absurd. It is widely, um, mis it's a widely uh, uh, held misreading of the social contract idea that it assumes that people are not self-interested. I make no such assumption. I mean that they're not altruistic. I do assume that people vary, and they vary a whole lot. I do claim that the world contains lots of kinds of people, including thoroughly selfish ones. You probably know some. Uh, so if we are aiming at universality, then it would indeed be biasing things to confine yourself to worlds full of people more altruistic than that. Sturba says that I am begging the question against other possible interpretations of that choice situation. I deny this. There is only one interpretation of the choice situation. It's the choice situation among everybody, where everybody is all kinds of people. And so the question is, what do you get all these kinds of people to agree on? If a lot of them aren't altruistic, your hope of getting them all to agree on altruism is zilch. Uh, if, on the other hand, we can identify an interest which I think we have, that everybody has, we can hope of agreeing on that, and that's the libertarian principle. OK, now, moving to uh, Sturba's position. How am I going on time, David? You have 10 minutes. OK, good. Um, um, I used, to, as Jim pointed out, I used to misread his view and attribute to him uh, a much narrower level of required concern for others than he actually has. Um, namely, uh, I, he used to talk quite a lot about starvation and saving people from that. Now he's talking about basic needs, but he's going a lot farther than that. He used to have, a, I, I thought, a sort of minimal welfare, uh, welfareism, uh, where only those who really have exhausted their options, and then only those who are on point of starvation, are to get the coerced assistance, which is the subject of the debate between us. I do claim that he can't even get that from our common starting point, but I also noted that there's not much of an issue here, since in current America and most of the G20 countries, excepting, of course, good old Russia, there just isn't enough in the way of need at that level to worry about. With no welfare state, there wouldn't be either, just as there wasn't to speak of even in late 19th century America, let alone current America. But I find that I underestimated his commitments. And I must thank him for pointing out uh, that he now claims to take on a great deal more of a load than that. 
we turn out to be, quote, guaranteed the resources for a decent life, but no more, all of us. And that means that in his view, the state can take um, as much of our income as it needs uh, to satisfy what he would regard as the basic needs of everybody. And that sounds pretty far out egalitarian, doesn't it? Now, a couple of comments on this. Number one, it isn't clear how egalitarian it is. For, of course, the impact of this depends on how you answer this question, which he raises in the book, how do you distinguish basic from non-basic needs? An important question, how indeed? But Bo Jim, though he does raise it, doesn't actually answer it. He assumes that we have some sort of a handle on that distinction. Well, sorry, the distinction as he defines it goes like this, basic needs, if not satisfied, lead to significant lacks or deficiencies with respect to a standard of mental and physical well-being. And that's page 13, footnote 14, for those who want to look it up. So, of course, everything depends on just which such standard is being employed, a standard. But which standard? And how do you decide what that standard is going to be? One may be forgiven for thinking that the original question has been somewhat swept under the carpet here. Thus, he says that the rich, of course, have more than enough resource to satisfy their basic needs. Well, how does he even know that? In some places, Jim is ready to account the American poor, in the sense of people below the American poverty line, the official one, in terms of income, as being among those whose basic needs aren't being met, while allowing that the uh, roughly two-thirds, I think it's more like 90 percent, of the population of India who are below that line are nevertheless, maybe it's 98 <laughs> percent, who are below that line are nevertheless not all to be reckoned as among that set of people who the rest of us are supposed to turn aside while they plunder our luxury goods. If, of course, you think that people's basic needs aren't being met when they only have two TVs, 1.5 cars, indoor plumbing and central heating and air conditioning and a computer or two, that's what the American poor have, in case you didn't, you, I take it you all know that. If you don't, look it up. That's what they've got. <clears throat> that's the poor, the American poor. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, and so much to eat that obesity is their main problem rather than starvation, then it's no wonder that you'll go in for Castro-style confiscatory taxation of everybody above the assistant professor level in ranks of, in hopes of meeting those basic needs for all. If you want to get into the needs game a bit more seriously, you might ask why Jim keeps classifying the luxury needs as somehow not serious, not, you know. Uh, try asking the rich whether they really do need a Porsche. Some of them do, after all, in their view, and why does our view count and theirs not? Or, of course, a psychiatrist, not to mention a half million dollar course of cancer treatment or whatever. Don't tell me that it's impossible to have so much money that there isn't something that you need that you can't get with it. I'm afraid, if, I mean, I don't know very many rich people. What I've read about them suggests that they've all got things to spend their money on, which they claim that they need. And um, if you think, well, those aren't basic needs, then the question is, what kind of game are you playing? But notice, since I think the whole idea is wrong anyway, I think we don't have an enforceable duty to satisfy anybody's need for anything. We just have an enforceable duty to leave the poor blokes in peace, need or no need. I don't have to settle the question which needs are basic and which aren't. But he sure does. And I think it obvious that he hasn't done it here. Read the book, see what you think. Or if he has in the way noted above, then his theory would be, I think, regarded by most of us as putting him in pretty clearly in cloud cuckoo land. But I am quite willing to go back to my earlier generous reading of him, however, and settle for being on the brink of starvation as a suitably representative case of not having the needs he's talking about met. And yes, I think that even those people do not have the right to take what they need from us by force either. So back to the question, why don't I think we have that right? Why don't I think we have any of those duties? Because, I claim, the only basic right that we can all agree on is the right not to be harmed or molested or aggressed against and defrauded and, in general, worsened. Now, Jim again accuses me of question begging when he claims that my right is only a right to approved liberties, as if I had arbitrarily restricted the liberties the libertarian principle is concerned with. Well, he's wrong about that. In the passages from me that he refers to, where I point out that stealing from people who have acquired the goods in question without in their turn using force or fraud against anyone else is a violation of the libertarian principle, and that was our agreed terms of reference, I am, of course, using only that principle, not some imported bias from somewhere else, 
in applying the restriction in question. So when I say, of course, the poor don't have the right to steal from the property of the rich because it's their property. And because it's their property, my violating that violates their general liberty right. Now, as Jim has pointed out against Ronald Dorkin, quite correctly, the, liberal, the liberty principle doesn't say anything goes. It says, rather, anything goes in the way of actions that do not, in their turn, aggress against anyone else. Well, when the poor attack the rich, they are aggressing against someone else. And when the rich make a whole lot of money by perfectly voluntary means, as they usually do, they are not aggressing against anybody. So there's no question about it. What Jim is uh, calling for is a violation of the liberty of the rich. He is not just extending the idea of liberty in such a way that, what do you know, it turns out that poor guys have a right to attack us rich blokes. <clears throat> Think of me being one of the rich. Ho, ho. All right. Um, two minutes. Two minutes, good. We could get into lots of real world type issues here, some of which he and I do get into in the book, especially he, less me. And if, if we had time, I would go into them, but we don't. I want to just make a couple of quick comments about two. First, Jim wants to lean very heavily on supposed rights of future generations. This is in order to shore up his idea of uh, very substantial egalitarianism. Not only do the currently existing poor get to steal our stuff on his view, but so do zillions of people in the indefinite future. And that apparently is why all of us above middle class status can appropriately be compelled to confine ourselves to hair shirts and gruel. <laughs> Against this, I want to say two things. In the first place, as I have already remarked, it's a reductio of, of his idea on the immediate face of it anyhow. But second, Anybody who depends upon Malthusian premises about projections into the future for purposes like that really doesn't know what he's getting into. Malthus is dead. He's out. Relying on ideas of resource scarcity for conclusions like that is completely out of touch with reality. Our present world has the same amount of stuff in it as it always did, but we are all hugely better off now than we ever were before. And it's not because more manna has fallen from heaven in the meantime, but it's because a whole lot of very smart and very productive people have been able to use their smarts and productiveness enough to get us where we are. And of course, if only governments especially would get out of their habit of hampering so many of those people, even more of us would be ever so much better off yet. What's unforeseeable about the future is how much the bad guys will win in their campaign to hamstring the productive. But if, as we perhaps still dare to hope, it's not too much, then the only rational belief about the future of mankind is that A, we have very little idea what it will like, be like, but secondly, it'll be one heck of a lot better than it is now. I'm not going to comment on the other point because I've run out of time. I'm sure there will be ample uh, to talk about in the question period. It seems to me we already heard quite a bit of rebutting, but we did agree that there would be formal rebuttals. So, Jim? There is one point in John's argument that um, he, he makes this point, and if he were right about that, then, then things would move in a certain direction. Given I claim that he's wrong about that, then all the, a whole, whole host of problems he raises, from my view, become problems for his view as well. So let me show, the, show you where the juncture is, where, where everything depends on this point. Again, I said, Jan, uh, initially, that likes to look at this thing as a social contract theory. So it's a question of what principle are we going to choose, and we don't want to use morality to come up with morality. We want to try to do it on, on a non-moral foundation. And what Jan says here is that there is this point of agreement, and it's the point of agreement of we'll all agree to a liberty principle understood as a don't harm, don't aggress principle. So that will be the point of agreement. We might not agree to go on and do good for others, but we can agree don't harm, don't aggress. The problem with that is that that is we have to say, well, how, how do you know when you're harming and when you're aggressing? And if you say, and especially how do you know when you're harming and aggressing with respect to external possessions? Well, you harm and aggress when you are interfering with uh, people's property. 
Okay, so now we have to know, we have to be, now what is it, that, so people have property, have property rights. What is it to have a property right here? The private property right is to have a right of non-interference. It's to have a liberty, a certain liberty. Now, how do we know people have property right liberties rather than maybe welfare right liberties? Well, how do we know that the liberties of property are more important than the liberties of welfare? We need an argument. We need an argument about why the liberties we associate with property trump the liberties we associate with welfare. And until we have that argument, we can't say that when we interfere with property, we are harming with pe people. Because we may be harming people when we interfere with their welfare. So the whole issue of don't harm is predicated on a further analysis of, of what rights people have, or put it another way, what liberties should trump what liberties. That's why I said the whole thing is about competing liberties, competing liberty principles. You've got to settle that. And now how, so, so now the problem is which, which liberties are going to be the most important? Well, liberties are connected up with interests. All right? And now we're back to the only thing Jan can fall back on here, he, since he's get, you, I, I've now taken away don't harm principle. That's not going to be the point of agreement because the, that's, that's driven us back to look at liberties. And liberties has driven us back to look at liberty serving interests. And now, so we could have this mutual benefit principle. You know, sometimes he wavers to, yes, yeah, let's have a mutual benefit principle. Well, the problem there is that, yes, we have interests that don't conflict. And, and that would be very nice to serve those interests. But we also have conflicting interests. P rich and poor have conflicting interests. And now the question is, you just can't ignore those. So I'll, I'll take care of the, the non-conflicting interests, and, and we'll, have, we'll have principles of law that, that support those, but nothing about the conflicting interests. No, no, no. And the conflicting interests are big time interests. So that brings, so now, now, there, now, once you've, now, once the view has moved in this direction, we've got to talk about conflicting interests and which in, conflicting interests should trump which conflicting or which liberty. Liberty of the poor should trump liberty of the rich. Liberty of the rich should trump liberty of the poor. We now have to, well, well we get back to, well, needs, importance of needs, uh, ranking of interests, and we're all back to the things that Jen says, well, how are you going to fix this? How are you going to determine what basic needs are? Well, we need to do that. Otherwise, we have, we have no political principles to live by. We have to be able to make some determinations here. Otherwise, it's just war against all. Of, against all. It's, it's no good. So, and I, it seems to me we can make some determinations, some important interests, some things that are fundamental, food f uh, interests that are fundamental, uh, uh, ho housing interests that are fundamental. Um, Jan makes the comment about, oh, look at India, look at the United States. Uh, well, the way I would read this, I, there's a problem here. I mean, again, you ha these are problems that now he has to solve as well as I, because everything is going to be on which conflicting interests, which conflicting liberties are you going to go with. Well, the way I would read that is that the basic needs in India and the basic needs in the United States are the same, but the means generally available for meeting basic needs in India are different or cheaper than the means for meeting basic needs in the United States. What's happening in the United States is that the basic needs are met in a way that also meets non-basic needs. You go on the, you go on the, in the, in the supermarket, and you go down the cereal aisle, there's all these different cereals, boxes, toys, offers. I mean, the cereal in the box, you know, costs 50 cents. The, the cereal uh, that they're selling you costs $4. So if we wanted to uh, find ways to uh, economically, efficiently meet people's basic needs, we find other ways of distributing the things that really meet basic needs. If we're going to mess things up when meet bond basic and, and basic together, well, it's going to get more costly. So, so the idea would be, since we're thinking about a worldwide scheme here, libertarians, li uh, liberty rights, which turn out now to be welfare rights, turn out to be worldwide, we look for a way of efficiently making meeting basic needs worldwide. And we're going to have to find ways to more efficiently meet them in the United States. And, and, and that will bring, also find ways to, more, to uh, if meet more basic needs in India and in places like that. So eventually, there's going to be kind of a stabilization. Again, if we have to deal with conflicting interests, as I think we do, then we're going to have to do something like this. Um, so um, you know, you can also talk about the uh, United States, everything's fine. But there are places in the United States, things are not fine. If you go to Pine Ridge, the uh, Indian Reservation, 
Uh, you, you know, the life expectancy is 50 years. All sorts of diseases, 500, 200, 300 times uh, greater than the average expectancy in, in, the, in, in the population. And there's just lots of places like that in the United States. So things are not great across the United States. We're not all doing, meeting our basic needs in the United States. Some people are and doing far better and some people are not. Again, since we're going to have to be talking about conflicting liberties, conflicting interests, we're going to have to deal with this problem. And hopefully we can do with, deal with it in a non-question-begging way. You know, see, one of the reasons why, and this is common ground here, why Jan and I do not want to appeal to morality to solve this problem is, again, the, the different moralities give different solutions. And it's unclear how you non-question-beggingly favor one morality over another. So again, that, that, ar that argues to back up off of morality, and religion too, different religions, different you know, solutions, back up off of religion, and now fi let's find a non-question-begging way to deal with non-conflicting interests and conflicting interests. And it's the conflicting interests that are the problem. Uh, if you think there's no way to deal with that, and it's now a problem for not just myself, as a welfare liberal socialist, but, 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 but it's a problem for the libertarian now because I've made it a problem by denying the harm principle. The harm principle is, doesn't work. You, you have to ask harm uh, 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 against what, what liberties are, are being, when, 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 who has the right liberty and therefore that's how you fix harm. So, so it's a problem we all have. If you think oh, it can't be done, there's no way to fix it, fine. There was a pro big problem. If you think there's a rational way, a, a non-question-begging way to weigh high-ranking interests trumping low-ranking interests and work this thing out, uh, then I think we, we, we can do that, and we can do it especially for fixing a minimum. Uh, if we come up with technological fixes that can, we can say everything's going to be fine for the future, fine. Uh, if we can't come up with technological fixes, then I think being concerned about liberty, which also ends up being concerned about welfare, leads us to be cautious about uh, the future and, and, and not to use up resources now that will put future generations in a bad way. The Iroquois Indians had a view that when they made major decisions, they asked what impact it would have on the seventh generation. Seven. I mean, look how we make decisions. I think the Iroquois were on to something. I think maybe they didn't go far enough, but they had a good idea. And I think we have to, if, again, we want to be, have a defensible view. I mean, look, we can, we can wreck everything. And future generations can look back on us and say, yeah, it was them in the 21st century. They really messed the world up. They put us in this horrible situation. And they were just as the worst kind of people you could imagine. And we'll be dead and gone. I would like to try to avoid that outcome. Jan, your rebuttal. Um. Again, I'll confine myself to, uh, uh, I think, a couple of points. Number one, conflicting interests. Now, what morality is all about, what it's all about is as a, it's a response to the potential for conflicting interests among people, for conflict among people. That's what it's for. If there weren't any conflicts, there wouldn't be any problem. So how do we resolve conflicts of interest? There are various ways. The libertarian way is to say, Let's find out who the guilty guy is and say he's in the wrong. Now, is the interest of the rich in conflict with the interest of the poor? No. There is absolutely no basic reason why the poor and the rich are in conflict. They have different amounts of money. Now, Jim imputes to the discussion this alleged interest of the poor in having welfare rights. And of course, they've got an interest of it uh, in it. After all, if you have a welfare right, it means you get to collect from me for free. Yeah, but do I have an interest in that? Sorry, no. So if you and I have to agree on a principle for regulating our principle, it isn't going to be that you've got a welfare right. Not for that reason, anyway. If you could show me that unless I fed you, it would be dangerous somehow for me, that would be a good argument. And Jim sometimes edges up to thinking he's done this, and nowhere has he actually uh, uh, filled the bill on that one. So until that time, it seems to me that the right way to deal with conflict is find out who's in the wrong, and then tell him to back down. 
That's Hobbes' fundamental uh, principle of morality, which is seek peace and only use violence, only use the methods of war when the other guy makes war on you. Jim proposes that when the poor make war on us, I'm not supposed to react by defending myself. Well, sorry, maybe he won't, but some of us will. And the question is, should they? If, if they have a general right of liberty to do what they want to, which means a right not to be attacked, the answer is, yes, they do. Um, and it's too bad for the poor if there are some who can't um, make a living without handouts from somebody else. But the point is, the rest of us don't uh, just naturally have an obligation to uh, fulfill those interests of theirs. We do often, most of us, have a certain altruistic interest in this. Most of us are nice guys. We will help out. That's true. But that's very different from accepting a principle that the poor actually have a right to our assistance, meaning a positive right, meaning a right to coercively exact our uh, assistance. That's what I'm denying, and it's the only thing that I'm denying here. Um, a quick further response on the last item that he brings up. We all are uh, interested in world poverty, not necessarily because it's a matter of justice, which I don't think it is, but still, we're interested in it. As I say, we're nice guys. We like to see people better off rather than worse off. What is the solution to poverty? now? I want to make a general answer to this. And the answer begins by distinguishing between poverty, which is a sort of ongoing condition, versus emergencies and disasters, which are short term. Charity is great for disaster relief. When disasters happen someplace and wealthy people like Americans, Canadians know about it, they respond like that. When the tsunami happened some years ago, how many of you here went right to your computer and donated a bunch of money? Right, I did immediately. I read it in the newspaper, I got on the computer, and pretty soon somebody had 150 of my dollars to help matters out or something like that. So many Canadians responded that the big problem at the other end was what to do with all the money and how to get around all the goddamn government officials who were preventing them from spending it usefully. It wasn't, do we have enough charitable people out there to help out? We do. But poverty isn't like that. To relieve poverty, what you need, and the only thing that you can possibly do, is um, get enterprise going there. And the only way you do that is to get uh, impeders off of the backs of the people uh, whose poverty is in question. We need to get them working. And the only way you do that is with investment, not with charity. Charity is an ongoing cure for poverty. is complete nonsense. The only cure for poverty is investment. Let's get out there and help those people by using them, uh, using their services and hiring them and getting them out of the poverty that they're mired in by putting them to work. That's the way you do it, and there is no other way. That's the way half a billion Chinese have been cured of poverty in the last few years, and it's the way the rest of them will if the Chinese are able to continue the way they are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, I mean, I have no sympathy whatever with welfareism as a cure for poverty. It's not a cure. On, on the contrary, it's a way of perpetuating the situation. Thank you. Okay, we have some time for questions. Uh, please wait for a microphone to be brought to you, and then let's try to make the uh, uh, questions quick. Uh, we'll take one right there, and then bring another microphone over here. Hello. This is for uh, Dr. Sturba. Um, your, uh, a part of your argument hinges on the, on the dichotomy between needs and luxuries. And one thing that Dr. Narvison said is he, he sort of challenged that, and I want to give you an opportunity to maybe respond. Um, it, it doesn't seem clear to me or to Dr. Narvison what that dichotomy is or even that one exists. Um, how do you know that one exists, and how do you figure out how to draw the line? You say that. Okay. Right. Um, now, remember, uh, making a distinction between needs and luxuries um, becomes is a problem for me, but I claim it will also be a problem for Jan as well once we show that he can't rest with a no harm principle. That once we see that, that we have to uh, be, look to uh, competing liberties to fix a no harm principle, we then have to go to competing interests to determine which liberties to fix. And then we're going to have to rank the interests into basic and non-basic. And so we're going to have to get to this um, basic needs versus luxury needs thing. So it's a common problem, okay? 
All right, now let me just, one way to, to come at my solution to it. He, he, quoted, he quoted me uh, the definition of basic needs. Uh, there was a little more to it, and there's a references. But let me come at it another way. Let me come at it from the final solution. The final solution, of course, is that uh, if, we do, if we're going to do this thing right, we're going to uh, allow ourselves only uh, the resources necessary for meeting our basic needs for a decent life. And that's what each of us is going to have. So what's going to, and now the way to fix this basic needs minimum is imagine the kind of minimum we each want for ourselves on condition everybody gets the same. Nobody gets more or less than that. So that's be the way to fix the minimum. See, the, all, the problem we have with fixing the minimum in, in our world is that the people who are fixing the minimum don't receive it. The people who are, are they, you know, it's the, it's the rich people who are deciding what the minimum should be for the poor, and they get this you know, back and forth thing. It's really difficult. Well, imagine you're fixing the minimum, and that's what you're going to get. I think we'll get a lot more unanimity there. I, will, I think it'll be a decent minimum. You know, the education will be part of it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, housing, food. It's going to be a very de a decent minimum. Recreational needs will be part of it. And, but that's what everybody gets. So that'll be, that's my, my best way of coming at it. Jan, did you have a response? Well, the quick response is um, he's simply wrong about this claim that I have to make the same distinction. I don't, since I claim we don't owe anybody anything in that respect. All we owe is to keep off their backs. All we owe them is peace. And that's completely independent of how much money they do or don't have. Yes, right here. You started off your presentation, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, by, by saying we're talking about negative liberties. And I don't understand. It seemed to me that you then define uh, entitlements as being a liberty. Yes. When, when you started off saying we're talking about negative liberties. I don't see how that follows. I can understand your confusion there. Uh, what happens here is uh, I'm, I'm trying to work from a libertarian base here. So we, we're dealing with negative liberties. Now, what is the, the, the standard right to welfare? It's a positive right. It's not a negative right. This is what you're, exactly what you're thinking. Ah, but see, what I've done now is to find an analog in the, on the negative side that will do the work of something like the work of a positive welfare right. It's the right not to be interfered with in taking from the surplus possessions of the rich what you need for to meet your basic needs. That, we, if, you can, if you have that right and you exercise it, you will get for yourself the, the, something like what the positive welfare right would, would give you. Now, there's, there's problems. I mean, suppose you're so weak you can't even go to the rich to, to take from their surplus. Well, now that we can put a little uh, epicycle in it. Then we could have Robin Hoods who kind of will move the resources from the rich to the poor so that that, that, will, that will be taken care of. So, I mean, look, what I'm trying to do is not to say that, that libertarianism leads full, full throttle to welfare liberalism and socialism. I'm saying that what libertarianism leads to is something that's so close to welfare liberals and socialism, libertarians should just throw up their hands and join the welfare liberals and socialists. That's the arts of argument. I basically, basically thrown out the concept of negative no, I haven't. Okay. No, I haven't. Oh, you want a quick comment? Well, I mean, of course you're right. The so-called liberty to take from the surplus, uh, so-called surplus possessions of the rich something is ipso facto not a liberty which a libertarian can accept that people have because it consists in violating their liberty, namely their liberty to make money in the usual ways by purely voluntary means, which might uh, result in your amassing a fortune. You do it that way, anybody who takes that is attacking you. The liberty to attack you is obviously something that the libertarian right says you don't have, obviously. So Jen's you're absolutely right about correct. That. Jen, it's absolutely correct here. I am not defending the liberty to, ta to take from the rich uh, to meet your, your basic needs. I'm defending the liberty not to be interfered with in taking. That's the negative. That's crucial. <laughs> Remember I said I gave you an analog to a welfare right. It's, it's a, a, a right of non-interference. Jan keeps slipping every time I do this. I point it out for him. He changes it in one text, and then it comes back to it's a liberty to take. Uh, no, it's a liberty not to be interfered with in taking. That's crucial. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understand that. <laughs> if, if you don't believe in the liberty of men to rape women, 
but you said you believed in the liberty of men not to be interfered with in the process of raping <laughs> women. That seems like a distinction without a difference. Now, I'm sh- and, and I don't mean to okay. imply that, that, that taking goods is equivalent to rape, but, but, but how's the difference? But look, uh, on, on, a, on a real phenomenology here, there's all sorts of, of, of liberties that are possible liberties. And one possible liberty is not to be interfered with when you're raping a woman. Uh, that liberty will hopefully will say nobody should have. Okay, but, but that just shows you that if you're going to decide what, what, that some liberties are privileged, you have to at least have the whole expanse of liberties there and then give an argument for why you're privileging some over others. That, so, you know, liberty not to be interfered with when, you want it, when, you're, when you're shooting somebody to get their money. That's, that, that's, that's a liberty. Hopefully we can make an argument that people shouldn't have that liberty. But that's, you have to let everything in before you decide which are the privileged ones. No, we're, we're, we're going we're to keep the discussion up here. As I pointed out in my discussion, uh, the liberty to do what interferes with somebody else is not an available libertarian liberty. We defend all and only those liberties which are compatible with a like liberty for all. Rape is not on that list. Neither is robbery. Okay. Let me see here. All right. I'm looking for someone I do not know to be a libertarian intellectual. <laughs> All right. Let's take, let's take a question right there and then in the back row there. Jay, hand him the microphone. Sure. Question for uh, Professor Sturba. But unless you believe that some people, that the poor are poor because the rich are rich, doesn't the redistributive case collapse of, uh, uh, simply on pure moral grounds? Um, I'm, not, I'm not claiming that, uh, and Jan and I, an earlier debate two weeks ago, somebody went after Jan by saying, look, uh, the, the property, the property pe- the r- a lot of rich people have mass, they got by illegitimate means. I jumped in and defended Jan. I said, look, let's not talk about it that way. Let's imagine that the rich got their, prop- or, or their possessions by, by what, not interfering with anyone. There still becomes my problem. My problem is, look, you've got these possessions. You didn't interfere with anybody to get them. But now, for the poor to meet their basic needs, there is issue about whether they can Take some of what you possessed or not. Now, see, here's the problem. I'm granting that the rich produce something. They, they, now, the question is, what is the, the productive uh, power uh, give a person? Does it give it, them entitlement to everything they produced? Or does it give them entitlement to some of what they produce? So that if there's somebody else that comes upon the scene that needs some of what they produced, and now the question is, should they be given the right of non-interference with respect to getting at that? And I'm saying, well, let's weigh, the in- let's weigh the liberties. There's a liberty of the, of the poor here not to be interfered with, not a right liberty to take, and taking from the surplus possessions of the rich, which we're imagining they got somehow with not doing anything wrong. Now we don't, it's hard to get, we're getting morality in here. And, and, or is it is the liberty of the rich to not be interfered with in using that surplus for whatever reasons, they, for whatever purposes they want? And I'm saying we have to settle that question. And the question then is, we can't do it on a no harm principle. We have to do it on a weighing of the interests. These are conflicting interests. We have to say which conflicting interest is most important. Oh. Oh. Right. Um, well, just another quick response. As Kant and Hobbes pointed out, to have a right is to have a right to be defended in whatever it is you have a right to. Those go together. If you say, oh, well, this is yours, but you're not allowed to defend yourself if somebody comes and tries to take it, then it's not yours. This is double talk. I agree. I thought I'd mix things but up and you, ask if a question. But if he agrees with that, then his whole argument goes out the window. What? No, no, it doesn't. Sounds like it. You, you, you what, what? Well, what do you want? He, he, so he says, if you have a right, then you, then you have a right to, you, to defend the right. Fine. Now, the question is, when we have these conflicting liberties between the rich and the poor, we have to decide which, is, which liberty should have priority. That liberty will then become the right. So if suppose we say, go with me, that the, the right not to be interfered with and taking from the surplus possessions of, of the rich uh, what you need for survival is the preferred liberty. So you have a right to do that. Now that means that you, if, if somebody, if the rich come up and start stopping you, you can defend, you can fight them back legitimately because you have the right and they don't. 
or if somebody else comes in to try to stop you from taking from the surplus position, that you can defend yourself. You could say, look, I have the right not to be interfered with you, and, and you would be right. Jan is, Jan's principle, Hobbes in, Locke in, or uh, Kant in, we, I agree. Okay, right there. Right. This is a question for Dr. Narvison. Uh, if I understand correctly, you're saying that uh, the abstract is only important as it relates to the practical, or not only important, but is important. Yep. And your uh, argument centers around the principle that you know uh, non-interference is a principle that everyone can agree to. So my question is, if people knew the economics that you have maybe an 80% chance of being born into poverty compared to what we in America would consider as poor, and you have a 0.001% chance of having a jet, it seems like not very many people would agree. You know, if you came to me and said, I have this great principle, it's the most fair way to do things, and you have an 80% chance of being born poor, I would say, I don't know, that doesn't sound like a very good principle. So how do you defend, you know, an abstract thing which so clearly doesn't end well for everyone? Why would people agree to that? The reason why all moral philosophers have talked about universal is 0.001% is some. 99.999% isn't all. So let's get an agreement between those, a real agreement now, not a coerced agreement between those 0.001% of the rich or whatever, and the 99.999% of the poor. Why does the fact that there are so many of the poor out there who would like to steal your stuff um, overwhelm the contrary um, uh, uh, interest of, of the people whose stuff they would steal? Well, in the contractarian view, the answer is it doesn't. We've got to have unanimity, and we aren't going to get it on behalf of, of that. We are going to get it on behalf of everybody recognizing everybody's right to deal with people on a voluntary basis in whatever way they can. And that's a way which, by the way, the historical track record as well as common sense shows you works fabulously well, way better than war. You want to get rich, what you need is peace and enterprise, not war, including not the war of the poor against the rich, which is what he's fomenting. So, so Jan says, look, you got to get actual agreement here. You, you, even if there were all these poor, you got this, some rich who won't agree because they don't want to give up their resources. Now, it seems to me that that, that can't be the principle of our thing. We got to have actual agreement. That 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 pre, I mean that that if that, and the way he's going to run it, that's going to mean there's going to be no welfare rights because he's already in the background by uh, by his principle of no harm. He's got the the, the 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 strong property rights in place. But but. Uh, you know, he's, he's got there, uh, assumed it was not morally neutral, but it didn't get morally neutral in there. It was already, he's made a decision. But look, what, if, what, why you, the actual agreement thing, you can see there's a real problem. The poor won't agree, the rich, the, the rich won't agree. Now, what, so then what you have to do, it seems to me, is to back up and say, can we give a good argument that here, we're, if we were trying to look at the interests of the rich and the poor, can we give a good argument for them going one way or another on this? And that's my approach. Okay, right here, and then Jay, take a microphone to the lady in the back. Well, um, uh, my question is to Professor Sturba. Uh, wasn't this kind of system tried already uh, and uh, elsewhere, ended up in millions of dead and machine guns and things like that? Um, German ideology by Marx, uh, when he kid uh, didn't come even up to proletarian class warfare, he was talking about underclass, well, that means welfare recipients probably. Uh, so I think that was uh, that was already tried. Then another kind of question. I'm labor economist myself. Uh, what kind of incentives for the people would be to do anything under that system? Uh, two things. So was it tried? No. Uh, I mean, this. I, I mean, you you had a communist system. But it wasn't really a communist system. I mean, probably the closest thing to it, it's tried Sweden. I, the closest thing to where it's tried. Now you can run back arguments back and forth. But the Soviet Union, you know, you, 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 you um, scrape below the surface and you really had a czar, czar system. Uh, and it's so easy, the transition from, from communism to capitalism, the, the, the communists became ca capitalists. I mean, they're, they're the ones that own the, 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 the means of production now. So it, was, it, was, it, was, there, there, it wasn't any big difference. There's rich and poor now in Russia as there were rich and poor uh, in, in, uh, there, under, the, under the Soviet Union. Um, What's the, second, what's the second point? What is the incentive? Oh, the incentive. Well, um, uh, I mean, one way you, you, you might run it is, is a moral incentive. But the way I, my, I'm being someone who want to do the moral thing is this is the only good argument we can give for how the rich and the poor should live, live together. Now, if that doesn't, 
I, I don't know what to do. Do, do. do you want to support your position with a good argument, or you don't want to support your position with a good argument? If you give up argument, fine, we're out of the game. We, we philosophers, I think, are gone. Uh, but if you want to find what is a good argument to deal with this, then you've got to run in, in the direction I have. And that's all we can do. Well, I, I, it, was that the question on incentives you were asking? Uh, I, well, yes, well, because most people consider and, and so if uh, fruits of labor are being taken to share them with them, uh, uh, then uh, why people uh, would not just sit on welfare? That's what happened every, everywhere else. They, yes, uh, they, they're not allowed to do that in my system. I mean, the, the poor have to work as hard as they can. That's, that's the requirement here. I, and the rich have to work as hard as well. Well, the poor, the rich have to use work, work as hard to help the existing poor that can't otherwise meet their basic needs. I just came from the Library of Congress, working on archives, on Soviet archives. I'm from Soviet Union originally. And uh, very interesting notes by Lenin. Lenin is saying, I'm telling these rich people what they should do. They don't. And I'm thinking, what if we'll shoot a couple of them publicly? <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's like, I think, exactly where it would lead. I mean, if, you, if uh, there's besides certain people who would be greedy, who wouldn't like to share, and definitely well, that would end up again with machine well, guns and everything else. Well, my, my hope here is, I mean, you know, this is the, the, the view I'm arguing for is a very demanding view. And if you just sort of, oh, it's imposed on people, well, it's going to be hell. Uh, but what, what I'm trying, what I, my idea is, sh let's talk about this argument. Let's work this, you know, and, and once you see, look, we've got, to, we've got to come up with a good argument for how rich and poor should relate in society and the world and, you know, and into the future. And, and, and now it's, let's talk about it. It's the, look, this argument was so complicated, it seems to me, pretty simple. Maybe it's wrong, but, but it was also pretty simple. I think we could, we, if people came to my conclusion about what a good argument leads here, then you're not going to have to do much coercion. Uh, you know, people will say, look, this is the only way we, I can behave in a way that I can give a good argument for it vis-a-vis -vis other people. So I'll do that. Okay, back there, yes. Wow. Um, in terms of this good argument, Dr. Sturba, aren't you um, conceptually counting on sustaining the very thing that you're trying to destroy? If you go back to... 16th, 17th century, and we have your system in place, where is the wealth coming from that will sustain? Where, what, what would society look like today, in your view? What would the world look like? Well, I mean, I think we wouldn't have uh, destroyed lots of, lots of natural resources that we have uh, in, in, this, in this development. I, I'm sure, you know what we may well have? You go back a little bit further, uh, we would have, now that John will uh, join with me here, we would have preserved American Indian nations, uh, uh, South, uh, Central, uh, you know, Aztecs, the, the, uh, uh, the Incas, these wonderful civilizations, and, and, and learn what contributions they would be making to, to the new world. Because we wouldn't have used coercion, and certainly not Christianity, to come in and say, you're no Christian, so you don't have any, you know, you don't, you don't count. Uh, you know, just think now. Where John would the and I wealth would join, join come hands from here. that you're distributing? What? Where would the wealth come from that you're redistributing? Well, the point is, if you if you have my perspective, this is a, this is a good argument. Talented people will want to do their best, and poor people will want to do their best too, because everybody real, realizes in this system, it's it's a fair system, because it's supported by a good argument. And, uh, and there's no other system that's, that, that has a good argument to support it. And so they're going to do their best in it. They're, everything else would be bad. Anything else, they'd be taking advantage of people, or other people would be taking advantage of them. And that's why they, they'll go with this system. Do I hear echoes of from each according to his ability and to each according to his well, Fine, fine, with, with a libertarian twist. <laughs> <laughs> OK, give the microphone, Jay. Jay, take the microphone to Sheikha Dalmia, who I was trying to call on earlier, and then give the other microphone to the gentleman behind her. Thank you, David. Um, I just have, I'm just curious, uh, and this is a question for Professor Sturba. Uh, you know, this is sort of a meta question, which is that you have perfectly good frameworks to defend the position that you're defending, the outcome that you want. You could use a Rawlsian framework, as a gentleman previously was doing. You could use a Marxian framework. Why use a libertarian framework and give such a contorted definition of liberty to get where you want to get? I, I mean, I'm just genuinely puzzled by that. 
Well, what I think has happened with the libertarians is they've ignored a whole set of liberties in coming with their conclusions of well, what people have a right to. And, and so there's this big gap in the view. And I'm just exploring that gap because what I want, of course, is unanimity here. If I can show the libertarian view leads to equality, whoosh, the welfare liberals will slide along, the socialists will be cheery. I mean, we're all, I mean, it, it, we, we now have, have our, because the libertarians were, were, were the one, were whole, big holdouts here. So this was very important to bring the libertarian view along with, to, these, to these conclusions. Uh, well, then just one follow up. Given that you're not get, getting, you know, that consensus that you're seeking in this room, will that persuade you to give up your project then? Oh, God, come, come now. Not overnight. I mean, Jen and I have been working on this. And actually, our, if, you, if you would look back, our arguments have been evolving. And Jen, I've been listening more to Jen in a certain way, try to put the argument differently. I mean, I used to put this argument in a way that used a moral standard for deciding what liberties should trump what liberties. And I go, Jen, oh, not moral standards. Got to be more fundamental than that. We got to get down to Hobbes and something. OK, let's work. Work there, and, I, and, and notice when he when he presented this, he talked about uh, altruism and, and self-interest. When I presented it, I didn't talk about altruism at all. Now it was there, but I had a way of getting. I talk about other other people's interests and your people and, and, and my interests. I was had a way of getting the altruism in in a way that would, was an easier slide than the way I had presented on earlier stages. So you know, give us time or give me time. Maybe Jan will convince me too. Um, but 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 you've just maybe heard this for the first time, and this is probably shocking to you uh, if you have libertarian sentiments. I would say at least get the book. I'm sorry it costs so much, uh, but but but. You know, and read the argument on, on, on my side and the Jan's too, and maybe you can email me and convince me I'm wrong. I'm willing to go with this. I, I came here to see how good this argument was. And I'm, I think I'm willing to give it up if I heard a good argument for giving it up. I'm listening. I'm trying to listen. Maybe I'm you know, biased. But, but, but this was the whole venture. And this is the way we philosophers should be operating with in this way.